Hi there, and welcome to Insight Quantum, the podcast telling the human stories behind the latest developments in quantum technologies. I'm Dr. Stephen Thompson, and I'll be your host for this episode. In previous episodes, we've talked about some of the challenges facing quantum computing, both on the hardware and software sides, and we've discussed some of their potential applications. Quantum computing could even prove to be one of the most significant technological developments of our time. We'll see what the next few years bring. One of the other biggest technological revolutions happening at the moment is the development of machine learning and so-called artificial intelligence. But what about combining aspects of both? Can quantum technologies be used to enhance the machine learning revolution? Today's guest is one of the pioneers of quantum machine learning. It's a pleasure to be joined today by Dr. Kusuke Mitarai, an assistant professor at Osaka University. Hi, Kusuke, and thank you so much for joining us here today. Hi, hi. So, before we get into the details of what quantum technologies can bring to machine learning, let's first talk about your journey to this point, and let's go right back to the very beginning. What first got you interested in quantum physics? Well, my, my father had a book about quantum physics in, like, for um, middle school students and things. So um, that, that was my first contact with the quantum physics. And yeah, I, I read that kind of book at the age of like 15 or something. And then, yeah, I was very interested in like the concept of the superposition and all those, you know, double slit experiment and things. So that, that made me in, interested in quantum physics and, and that still kind of excites me. <laughs> like the superconducting, uh, I mean, su- superposition, mm. um, uh, superposing like principle of quantum physics is, so, yeah, is really interesting to me. Um, still, uh, as, a, as a researcher in this field. I see. And then when did you decide that you wanted a career in quantum physics? That, you know, you were interested in it from a very young age, but was it obvious to you from the beginning that you wanted to work in quantum physics? Or is it an interest that developed over the years? So, yeah, as I was kind of interested in this, um, in, in the field of quantum physics, in, as a middle school student. So I chose um, some special kind of school in Japan. Like there's a, um, so in Japan, usually we go to, so at the age of 15, we take an exam, entrance exam for the high school. Mm -hmm. And then um, we go to that high school for like three years and then go to university. That's the, that's the uh, standard route to the university, but I took a different way. There's a <laughs> something called like national technology schools, <laughs> which is a which which is a five year school, and we go there after just just after we finish the middle school. So we go we we go uh, we 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 take an entrance exam to the to that school, and then. Um, we go to the uh, we we go to that school for like five years. So we go fifteen. Uh, we go to that school from fifteen at the age of fifteen and to twenty. And so that that school uh, that school is for like um, educating engineers mm-hmm. in like very industrial things, uh, industrial fields. For example, I was a student of like electronics and. Um, information science kind of related um, class and yeah that so that that school works like uh, half like university and we study about very special and very specialized things in that school so I was because I was interested in quantum physics so I took that course to study about like electricity which is kind of related to um, quantum physics and information is also like kind of related because we 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 know that quantum computers are like can can be made by like quantum physics so that's that's kind of related and i was yeah i i i chose that route to go (laughs) and so in that sense i I decided to um, go into this field at the age of 15, kind of, mm-hmm. but 
you know, I was not into this quantum computing field un until I was like, I, until I entered the university. So um, that depends on like how, how, how you define this, this field. But <laughs> I was, so I was, I decided to go to a related field at the, when, 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 you know, I graduated from middle school and I really specialized in this quantum computing field when I got into this uh, graduate school. So that, so there's a, a graduate, I, I gradually go, go, I gradually went into this field. So. It's always interesting to hear how people got into quantum computing. Very often people started off uh, in, in a background like yours where they studied electrical engineering or computer science and then approach quantum computing from the, the information theory perspective um, rather than historically I think people maybe came from the, the many body perspective. It's very interesting that in the in the last sort of 10 years it seems like many more people working in quantum computing come from this computer science, from information theory, from electrical engineering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so yeah, I, I was from the electrical engineering but um, kind of so my, my school told me like semiconductor physics and things. So I'm kind of <laughs> physics background and also like uh, electricity, like engineering background. So I have like really in the <laughs> very, how do you say this? <laughs> Intermediate or uh, how, yeah. how do you say this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. In, in, exactly. in the middle of these yeah. <laughs> things, <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, it's always fascinating to hear the, the different backgrounds that people have. Everyone has a different perspective on, on how they approach quantum yeah, computing. Yeah. So at the moment, you're an assistant professor at Osaka University. Uh, how did you get to this point? Can you give us a, a quick summary of your career from graduate school to where you are now? Okay, okay. So um, actually, I, as an undergrad, I was like, uh, so in Japan, actually, we uh, we are assigned to some lab at the at the fourth year, like final year of the, of the undergrad student under, undergrad uh, university. Yeah. And yeah, but I was not assigned to a lab which is related to like quantum computing. I was assigned to a lab which are doing like semiconductor research, and I did one year research in the, in that lab and I, I I actually have a paper about that <laughs> about that uh, field it, there's just one paper yeah it, which is very like <laughs> uh, strange from thinking of my my like other research papers yeah. but yeah so yeah I actually I was actually yeah doing very different research when I was undergrad but I decided to uh, go to the like, quantum computing field to like in, in the graduate school and then yeah that that was that was like <laughs> that was like game changer in the in, in my life uh, so so my lab was run by uh, professor kitagawa and he and also like there, there's us um there's assistant professor called neighbor sensei in in the lab too and i was like uh so i was kind of assigned to a neighbor science group into uh to to you to do like some experimental quantum machine learning mm -hmm. and uh, there i met like fuji uh professor fuji who is a professor at the Osaka university right now but he was like in a different university when when i was like uh when i was a graduate student but yeah, so uh, he and Negor san was uh, doing joint research about like experiments. So so he well, um, Fuji sensei is the theorist, and uh, Negor san is the experimentalist. So um, he he and well, they they are doing joint research, and I was like assigned to that project to do like actually do the experiment, and yeah, that was my. Uh, and that was my start in the in the field in in this field, and then later Fuji Sensei gave me some ideas like theoretical ideas to to what uh, to to develop some algorithms for for quantum machine learning, and then yeah I I started to uh, I started the theoretical research in the 
uh, in the end, actually, in the end, like, so I started as, a, as an experimentalist, but I, you know, kind of switched to the theoretical side of the quantum computing when, when Fuji Sensei gave, gave me the idea. And after that, <laughs> after that, like, after that was like very fast, like Fuji Sensei and, and Negor san had the idea of like founding a startup called Kinesis. And I was kind of asked to join the join the startup and I said just yes because you know you know that that sounded very exciting to me so I just said yes and yeah that was why I co-founded that that company Kinesis and then then after you know I was doing a research and doing doing quantum computing with research as a as a you know, as a part of Kunasis and as a part of this uh, lab at Oscar University. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I wrote some papers and then got the, uh, got the PhD. And then, you know, Fuji Sensei has become a professor at this Oscar University. And then, you know, um, so in Japan, when you when when someone becomes professor, he he usually takes assistant professors like in a group and he selected me to, he he chose me as an as uh, in that mm -hmm. in that position and that's and that's a, like brief <laughs> history of my career um, after the graduate school <laughs> wow so yeah you started in semiconductor physics then experimental <laughs> physics then got involved yeah. in a startup moved into theory and, and now you're an assistant professor that that's yeah, an amazing yeah. number of very different things that you've done <laughs> it is well i have like very few papers about like experiments but so i couldn't call myself experimentalist <laughs> right now but <laughs> yeah so i guess it must give you a good grounding though in in real, yeah, in real yeah, life yeah. and in real that experiments was, yes that was very yeah, nice experience to have, like doing actual experiment, do uh, using like quantum simulators and things. So that was very, yeah, that was a very nice experience to have to, you know, become a theoretical quantum computing, you know, researchers. Yeah, I imagine it. It's probably an experience a lot of theorists would benefit from the chance to to mm -hmm. understand experiments a little bit more closely and see how they really work, what the real limitations are. So if you weren't doing your current job, if you were not uh, a theoretical quantum computing researcher, what do you think you would be doing instead? Well, that's an uh, that's, uh, interesting question. And, <laughs> you know, and so my, my like, uh, the, the choice that changed my life was like choosing a quantum computing lab at the, at the graduate school. So if I didn't yeah, if I didn't choose that, um, choose that lab when I got into this graduate school, then I would be, I, I think I would be doing like semiconductor research as a, uh, uh, you know, as same as the, in the undergrad school. And yeah, uh, in that case, I will be, maybe I will be, I, uh, maybe I have become like semiconductor uh, engineer at some company, at some private company, maybe for example Toshiba and mm -hmm. for example Panasonic and things. Mm -hmm. and those Japan's Japanese big um, electric company or something. I I would imagine to be doing s such kind of job. I see. Well, I guess luckily for the field of quantum computing, that's not what you chose. <laughs> So can you give us a, a, an overview of the field that you work in? What's the big picture goal of your field and how does your work fit into that big picture? Okay, okay. So I think my, well, I think, yeah, our goal is to make quantum computer practical. Like right now, quantum computers are not practical. Like they do not solve um, very useful tasks. They, they solve like very, well, they they just so very um, easy task which can be computed by like 
uh, classical conventional computers. So yeah, the the goal will be the you know making quantum computers practical, and my work is aiming that goal, aiming aiming to achieve that goal. So that's that's like I I am I always try to do think of some new ideas to how to use quantum computer for practical purposes. What do you think is the biggest challenge facing the field then? What's the, the biggest obstacle in using a quantum computer for more practical purposes? So that's the challenge is the noise in, on the quantum computer. <laughs> and yeah, for, for example, uh, when you when you think of like current state of the art quantum computer, they um, when you when you do some operations on the quantum computer, then it fails with like probability of one percent or something. Mm -hmm. So we can only do hundred hundred uh, operations on a quantum computer. But you know, for for doing the quantum computer, uh, for doing like practical computation, we need like more more and more, much more like much much more uh, quant um, operations on the quantum computer. And that's the challenge in this field. I think this uh, challenge is like very, very intrinsic to the quantum computer because you know qubits are very fragile. Mm -hmm. When you when you when you want to control the qubits, you know the qubits should be coupled to the environment, like 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 humans. So. <laughs> So um, that that couple makes the qubit very noisy and um, quantum computer and uh, consequently the quantum computer very noisy. So um, very intrinsic. So we have to so uh, to to solve this problem, I think uh, we are. I think the field is moving to um, to make a, to to realize a technique called quantum error correction, which can you know, correct the errors occurring in the uh, computing process um, uh, on a quantum computer. So, um, if you can realize this uh, error correction, then you know we can have many, much, much more uh, computational resources on the quantum computer, and then we can maybe, maybe we can solve much, uh, much more practical problems on a quantum computer. So. And but but <laughs> the problem is that if you if you like if you can if you can um, even if you can build the like quantum error correction, this quantum error correction has like very large overhead in the in the hardware requirements. So for example, if you want to uh, realize one logical qubit, then one 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 like protected error-free qubit, we need to implement or physically implement like thousands of qubits to make one error correct to the qubits. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, like if you realize a quantum error correction, the computing resource or the number of qubits is reduced by the factor, of, for example, thousands. In that case, theoretically, like we have to give some ideas to employ that kind of very limited number of qubits to uh, to be used for practical purposes. So yeah, the biggest challenge is noise and and well and that challenge can be solved the quant quantum error correction, but but that does not happen like very soon, like in, mm -hmm. in like two or three years that would be that would not happen. That's my opinion. But maybe in the five years and ten years when you when you have like uh, ten thousand physical qubits or something, or hundred thousand uh, physical qubits, then then you know, quantum error correction, error correction can I think quantum error correction can be realized, but uh, in in that regime we would have like much less physical, uh, logical or you know, error corrected qubits. So mm -hmm. we have to think of like ideas to use that uh, very limited, uh, limited quantum resource for like practical computers, uh, computings. So, yeah. 
So the challenge for the moment then is that uh, we have small, noisy quantum computers. Hopefully in time they will become less noisy and we need to find some practical use for these things. Yes, yes, that's, well, yeah, that, that would be the answer, yeah. I see, okay. So if I were to summarize your own research work in one single oversimplified phrase, I might say something like quantum machine learning. Now, our listeners might be familiar with machine learning uh, as, a, as a classical phenomenon, and they might be familiar mm. with quantum computers. Can you tell us what, what is quantum machine learning? What does quantum technology have to offer the machine learning process? As you may know, like quantum computing is known to like accelerate some certain computational tasks like uh, integer factoring and also um, simulating quantum mechanics. And so, uh, so actually, it is not known if this quantum machine learning is very you know, useful or not for like ex existing data sets actually. So there's no evidence in like um, there's a uh, there's no evidence in like making uh, you know proving this quantum machine learning is useful for like some data set or some machine learning tasks mm -hmm. like practical machine learning tasks. There's some 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 like very artificial setting where we can prove this um, quantum machine learning is useful. But in general, in general, in, in practice, we are not, we do not know if this quantum machine learning is uh, useful or not. So um, I would say like we are, <laughs> we are trying, we are still trying to make uh, the power of quantum computing to be applied for machine learning, but we actually do not know like if that turns out to be successful or not. So. Um, so yeah, um, uh, the answer to the question would be, actually, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I see. So I mean, it seems like a very new field with obviously a lot of a lot of open questions. Is there a reason to believe that quantum technology will help machine learning? Is there, you know, you said there are some examples where this can be shown to help. Is there a reason to believe that this will become more generally useful for for other problems? Um, actually, I, um, I am kind of skeptical about using quantum machine learning for like conventional machine learning tasks. For mm -hmm. example, you know, there's chat GPT, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's that kind of thing. Can maybe that kind of thing cannot benefit from quantum machine learning because, you know, classical computers are already doing very, very uh, good, uh, very, very good in that task. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> In, in that in that sense like so pra I think quantum uh, practical quantum computing would, would, uh, I mean the error predicted quantum computer would, uh, would be like 10 years away from now and in that 10 years I think chat GPT would become more more and more powerful mm -hmm. so uh, that would be like um, if, even if the quant even if we can find the quantum computers, can help like something like ChatGPT, um, like <laughs> do doing some something uh, something more than current ChatGPT would be would need very much much uh, trials and errors to <laughs> realize. So um, my opinion is that like something like ChatGPT cannot be accelerated by a quantum computer right, uh, right now like mm -hmm. we don't have actual quantum computers so we don't we cannot experiment, uh, experiment with quantum computers so um that's my opinion but in uh, on the other hand like we i think we um we can benefit from quantum machine learning when we have like quantum data sets i would say <laughs> um for example when you have like uh quantum circuits uh very much uh when you have like quantum circuits, um, that quantum circuit is like um, very hard to simulate classically. So like quantum computing process is very hard to simulate because you know, quantum computing have much more power than classical computers. So 
um, when you have like quantum algorithms or when you have like quantum circuits, then that kind of uh, data set, like if you have like many quantum algorithms and many quantum programs and quantum circuits, then that kind of data set would be uh, a nice candidate for like applying quantum machine learning because, because you know, classical computers are, I, I think, I believe quantum classical computers cannot um, analyze those, analyze and learn that kind of data sets because if you if you can do this, if you can do that, and that that will kind of imply qua classical computers are simulating that quantum algorithms. Mm -hmm. So um, that's uh, I, I think the best way to go uh, for quantum machine learning is to look for like some data sets that is that is more quantum. <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I guess it, this is kind of how quantum computing fits into the, the, the larger computing ecosystem anyway, right? Uh, quantum computing will probably be used for very specific tasks and will never replace classical computers. And from mm -hmm. what you're saying, it seems yeah, like yeah, yeah. quantum machine learning is the same. It will perhaps enhance some machine learning applications, but it will not replace classical machine learning. They're both good for different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, and in in your own work in particular, you mentioned their um, quantum circuits. So, you've played a key role in developing the field of um, variational quantum machine learning, and in particular, a thing that you called quantum circuit learning. Can you tell us a bit more about quantum circuit learning and what the opportunities and challenges are of using quantum computers to tackle these sorts of learning tasks? Yes. Yes. So, um, so quantum circuit learning is a uh, is a uh, well technique for using quantum circuits for like machine learning task. And in that in that paper, we uh, propose to use quantum circuit for as like um, uh, we propose to use quantum circuit like a neural network where we kind of um, tune or optimize the uh, circuit structures to uh, to do some like specific machine learning task for example when you when you when you train a neural network we we um, optimize the structure of the neural uh, structure of the network and and the weights in the network to and to uh, to to like realize some certain machine learning, learning task for example like mm -hmm. uh, for example, like recognizing digits, handwritten digits, for example. And so, yeah, in that paper, I, 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 or we propose to, we propose how how we can do something like that on the quantum computer. And well, um, so actually, that approach was. Yeah, I, I think that approach attracted much attention in the field, but actually we do not find, like, as I said earlier, we have not found any practical application of this uh, quantum circuit learning approach and also like other, there's many other uh, quantum machine learning approaches, but yeah, I think we have not found any uh, very practical approaches in the uh, to to use quantum computers for machine learning tasks. So the challenge in this field is to is to find some. I think the problem here is like we are we are not not we are not uh, short of like techniques to realize quantum machine learning, but we are kind of short of tasks that can be accelerated by the quantum computers. So uh, actually. Yeah, my uh, my uh, recent interest is making uh, is about making some machine learning task that can be that can be or that might be <laughs> um, accelerated by uh, quantum computers. That's very interesting, I guess, particularly for someone from my kind of background who studies many body quantum systems. And these, as you mentioned, these are things that cannot be simulated on classical computers. So. I guess for me, I, I see a lot of promise in this sort of approach for mm. for trying to solve these kind of quantum many body systems for, I guess, quantum chemistry, for 
drug design for all of these highly quantum mechanical problems that we don't have good ways of solving at the moment mm -hmm. maybe these are areas where quantum machine learning will one day be a, a big help yeah 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 you also mentioned earlier on that you were part of a team that co-founded a, a startup company so what made you decide to get involved in business as well as an academic career i guess either one of those careers is very difficult but doing both at the same time that sounds like a real challenge yeah um so um, the company uh, the goal of the company is a, is making like practical quantum software <laughs> that's that's the main goal and that's also my interest in in, in the research so that matches in the um in, so yeah the, the, the company scope and my my interest matches actually and also so why i decided to involve into this uh, company is that well, so as I said earlier, like the my my supervisors are uh, founded uh, also co-founded Genesis, and they kind of asked me to join the and join the founding process. So that was um, that was like that that made my uh, that made my decision to join the Genesis. But particular motivation in involved in Genesis is like no. I didn't, well, actually, I didn't know, like, the difference in the business and the, uh, and the academic career in that stage. Like, I was a graduate, I, I was, like, first year graduate student uh -huh. in, in when, when I founded Kinesis. So, I, you know, I was asked and I, that, that sounded me, that, that sounded to me, like, very exciting and very uh, fun thing to do. So, I just, uh, I just said yes. <laughs> that was that was the like process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like an easy decision. <laughs> <laughs> Has it been interesting to see the the business side of quantum computing as well as the research side, or for you, have they both always been been very aligned? Well, I I think it has been kind of aligned in the in the same direction because. You know, um, you know, Kinesis has started, and now is also uh, also now is like that, that company is a research company actually, and yeah, the main uh, well, they they do a lot, like joint research with the uh, big company like uh, in the chemistry field and also in like. Well, chemistry, yeah, chemistry field companies are main customers of, of the Kinesis, but yeah, they uh, their main um, their main job is to do research. So, um, in that sense, like uh, it's very aligned. I see. To to my to my yeah to my daily daily jobs or daily research, but well, other like business side, like we we so. Yeah, when I was working for Kinesis, like I was, I did like some uh, presentation to the company to mm -hmm. get a joint research <laughs> contract or something. So um, and that 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 experience was very nice too. You know, you know, we we have to. So when you when you are in academic, we usually don't have very frequent. Uh, interaction between this uh, business side of the company. Well, we we um, sometimes have an interaction between the with the uh, research side of the company. But uh, you know, mm -hmm. when you when you do a startup, we have to um, we have to involve this business side of the company uh, companies. So that was my and I think that was very nice experience to have. Okay, um, just a few final questions to wrap up with then. One is a question that I ask every guest on this podcast, which is that physics historically has been a field dominated by white cisgender men. And I think hopefully things are improving slowly over time, but there is still a long way to go before we reach any kind of equality. So I wanted to ask, over the course of your career, have you seen attitudes towards diversity changing or improving? And have you seen a difference in attitudes in business and in academia towards diversity? Yeah, I, I think in Japan we are 
and there's many like efforts in making this uh, inequality more, more, uh, more. How how is yeah, this? Reducing more. the inequality, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, the progress is very slow. <laughs> like my my classmates are all actually like all all men. Actually, like there's I I think there was like one one female student in in my class when I was an undergrad and also in the when when I was in the high school there was like only yeah my I as I said earlier I I went to like special kind of school where we only do like engineering stuff so mm -hmm. there is one one only one female student there too out of like out of like 40 in the high school and out of um, out of 50 or 60 in the in the in the, in the um, undergrad to school, so uh, I think the progress is very slow. And but I think it's making a progress. Actually, I I'm not very sure, but <laughs> yeah, I think it's making progress. And um, yeah, it's very. It, I think it's very hard to motivate the female students to come to the uh, field of this kind of you know, engineering, the physics field. Do you think it's it's hard to motivate people to come into a field where there is already a lot of inequality, and it perhaps doesn't feel? Very I guess so. Welcoming? I guess so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there's like, yeah. I I think there's many. And there's a uh, very strong bias in the in the people's minds to. Um, to not to go, not to so so for girls they they not to go to like uh, like engineering stuff and also to physics stuff. I, I, we we should be you know making like some efforts, um, some much more efforts to make that bias more uh, more smaller or something. Yeah, definitely. It, it seems like a very important issue. <laughs> I guess particularly we want as many people as possible to be working on quantum computing. We want the best people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to make people from all different backgrounds welcome so that we have as big a workforce, as diverse a workforce as possible. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, one final question then, which is, if you could go back in time and give yourself just one piece of advice, what would it be? Well, I think... I'm enjoying my life, so I would say, just take, <laughs> just take the you know choices that I took <laughs> in in my life. Actually, <laughs> I'm I'm kind of yeah, I'm really satisfied with my life. Actually, so <laughs> perfect. Then you made all the correct choices and wouldn't change a thing. Ah yes, yeah. <laughs> well, I, well, I don't know the you know other consequences of my you know, other choices, so. I don't know about the other, you know, possibilities, but yeah, I'm I'm quite satisfied with my life right now. Fantastic! I think that is a, a <laughs> great place to end this. So, yes. if our audience would like to learn a little bit more about you, is there anywhere they can find you on the internet or on social media, anywhere like that? Um. Yeah. When you uh, yeah, you can find me on the Twitter and also in on. Well, website, website. I think you can Google Google my name on the uh, on the internet to know about me. For example, you can Google me on the Google Scholar to look at my papers too. Yeah, that, yeah. Okay, perfect. Then we will leave some links uh, to your website on our own site, InsideQuantum.org. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kosuke Mitarai, for your time here today. Thank you also to the Unitary Fund for supporting this podcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. It really helps us to get our guest stories out to as wide an audience as possible. I hope you'll join us again for our next episode. And until then, this has been Inside Quantum. I've been Dr. Stephen Thompson, and thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>